welcome to today's live presentation of Cultures Unite, creating multicultural virtual classes that work. Audio for our event will be broadcasted through your computer speakers. If you would like the option to dial in to listen, please call 877-201-7923. Today's presentation is hosted inside an Adobe Connect virtual meeting room with integrated Audio One audio conferencing. We invite you to learn more about hosting your own events with Meeting One's tailored conferencing solutions during a brief Adobe Connect demo at the conclusion of the presentation. We are delighted that you have joined us today. We hope you have enjoyed our live presentation with our host, David Smith, Global Managing Director of Virtual Gurus. Welcome, David, and thank you for hosting us today. Excellent. Thank you very, very much. Um, delighted to be back with you. Um, some of you, I recognize the names as you were signing in, so uh, delighted to see some of you back in the sessions again with me. And, you know, did I actually say hello, ni hao, salam, ciao, hola, guten tag. You know, as we look at the world that we actually operate in when we actually work with our multicultural learners, of course, as you see by the statistics up here on screen, there's 7 billion people out there the 6,700 languages that are being used, and about 4% of the world actually consumes 96% of those languages. But of course, we think about business English as being our default. And you know, in it, that in itself gives us one challenge when it actually comes to working with multicultural learners. And definitely as we sort of go through today's session, what I want to do is to share with you, you know, what are some of the other challenges that multicultural audiences don't deliberately bring us. It's not their fault, you know, in culture. It's just how people are. It's how we, we exist. You know, no, no one culture is right. No one culture is wrong. But the fact that we bring multicultural learners together into our virtual sessions probably more than we do face-to-face -face, means that we've got these challenges that come to us. And, you know, as part of today's event, what I want to do is to help you in terms of looking at how can we actually overcome these cultural differences? What are those cultural differences, and what are they going to, how are they going to impact us in, in training? And, and although we're going to heavily look at virtual classrooms, of course, this, this learning, what you're going to take on board over the course of this next one hour, is going to help you in both your face-to-face -face as well as virtual learning. Because if I think about it, culture is something that, yes, it's very prevalent here in the virtual classroom, you know, as we look at it, we've got Carsten joining us from Munich, Nick and Christian joining us from the UK. We've got Tanya and Kate joining us from the US. I think it was Dominic who's actually out there in, in Hangzhou in, in China. You know, and we, we have others joining us from Manila in the Philippines and from um, the Netherlands. So the sheer fact of us bringing this virtual event together means that we bring multicultures into the actual event. So culture cultural intelligence, which is really the, the art of understanding, being aware, being sensitive to these different cultural challenges, is something that we're definitely going to be focusing on as we go through today. And culture itself can be a little bit strange. Let me give you a good example of that. You know, in that, if we actually look at this creature that's on your screen right now, and I hope that none of you are sort of reeling and jumping backwards and, and sort of being terrified at the fact that we've got this insect um, quite large on your screen. Because if I think about it, culturally as we look around the world, in the US, we would regard this as a pest. You know, it's, it's an insect, as a grasshopper, it's going to actually destroy crops, it's going to be a pain, it's going to cause noise. But if we went to China, for instance, you'll actually find certain individuals in China will actually keep grasshoppers as pets. They keep them in bamboo cages. They, they actually um, keep them for the song, the actual chirping noise that they actually make. You know, and, and you know, in Thailand, yeah, you'd beat me to it there, Dominic. In Thailand, you definitely would be eating them as a snack, deep fried, maybe covered with some sesame seeds. You know, so culture, as we look at it and as we move around the world, there are strange things that happen. Let, let's be honest. You know, um, there, there are, but as I say, I want to go back to the fact that no culture is wrong, no culture is, is right. It's just how we are. And we've got this, this big ball of, uh, of, of water and, and earth that we actually all survive on this planet. 
And ultimately, it's how we actually come together as a group. It's how we are inclusive that's going to be absolutely key there. And what we're going to do is, in, to, in terms of today is to help you to actually understand culture, but moving beyond the ethnicity element of culture. Culture is often something that we see because we see the color of someone's skin, or we hear the language that they speak. You're probably trying to pinpoint my particular accent. I said I'm based here in the UK. I am Scottish by birth. So hence the reason why there's maybe a little bit of an accent there that you're trying to place. But it's the color of someone's skin, it's the language, it's the religion they practice, the dress they wear. Those are tends to be the things that actually give us a very good clue about culturally how they may be as individuals. And, and the reality for us is that we actually can think of culture almost in the same way that we can think of an iceberg. And if you, if you remember the facts about an iceberg, around 75% of the iceberg's mass, if not more, actually sits below the surface of the water. And when we think about culture, there are things that we actually naturally see about individuals. You know, if we actually walk through um, the, the Dubai airport, for instance, if you're walking through there and you're seeing people with the dish dashes and the hibabs uh, and the, the sort of Middle Eastern dress, you're very quickly going to identify and think, okay, that individual is, is maybe you know, from Bahrain or maybe from Jordan, from Qatar or for, from Saudi Arabia or whatever. But what if that individual is actually in a Western business suit, shirt, collar, and tie? You're not going to see that. It's less obvious. But definitely, when we think about culture, what is totally in, uh, unobvious to us are the thoughts, the feelings, the things that are below the surface culturally that give us challenges, that make, make that person how they are, but it actually gives us cause for concern. Because as we go around the world, everyone is looking at the same ball of, of blue, if you like. We're all looking at the same planet, but we're looking at it through our own, our own eyes. We're looking at it through our own lens, if you like, which we'll come back to in a second. But if we think about it, what is culture? Uh, and, you know, there, there are so many different ways that you can actually think and look at culture. Um, there's the ethni ethnicity element of culture in terms of, you know, um, customs and, and beliefs. There's going to be role culture, so or organizational culture. If you were to work at Apple, it would be completely different. If you were going to work at a, a cement factory, it would be completely different. If you were in sales compared to if you were in design or if you were in marketing, you know, or you were in accounting. There's different cultures. But what we're going to be talking about today is the culture in terms of, as a definition from the dictionary, a shared pattern of preferred values, beliefs, attitudes, and assumptions and behaviors that define the way of life of an individual, or importantly, when we think about our learners, groups of individuals. You know, we can definitely determine that um, learners that are actually going to join us from Germany are going to behave a certain way or learners that are actually joining us from China are going to be slightly different, or the US are going to be different again. And one of the things that I've had as a bit of a mission now for about 10 years has been this passion to actually really help organizations to think beyond, we design a piece of training for our local culture. You know, so you might be based in the US, you've designed a piece of training, it's getting rolled out to a US audience. What happens when you now take that globally? And virtual classrooms has allowed us to do that. You know, the sheer fact that we can bring learners from disparate parts of the world together and bring them into one virtual classroom. The cultures now actually start to actually permeate a lot more for us. They become a little bit more obvious for us, and it, it causes us challenges. But, you know, the way I think about culture is very much that we can look at groups of individuals or individuals from certain countries, and it's just the way they are and it's the way they do things. And it's those cultural differences that will actually make a bit of a challenge for us. You know, what I want to do, and you know, very much I'm going to encourage you as we go through today's session to interact with me. There's going to be questions I'm going to ask you to participate in. Uh, there's questions you're going to probably want to ask. And I'm going to ask you in the, the left-hand Q&A panel to go ahead and use that for any question that you have that you want me to address live in the actual event. The chat panel itself is there just for natural chat that we're going to have amongst one another. But right now, you can see many of you actually starting to, to join in and get involved in the poll. 
what I'd like to understand is how many of you have analyzed or studied culture beyond what I call tourist culture? Let me explain what I mean by tourist culture. Tourist culture is if you're going to travel um, to a different part of the world, you might pick up a guidebook, a tourist book. You might go on something like Lonely Planet. So you'll get a better understanding of you know, how culturally maybe that, that, the, the customs might be, you know, what the dress might look like what sort of traditions and, and sort of celebrations they may actually have. And that gives you one aspect of culture. But for me, it doesn't make it deep enough of what we're talking about here. Now, I'm joined by Joel. He's going to help me out as we go through the session. And, you know, Joel, by all means, if there's any questions we need to pick up on, let's pick them up as we go along. Absolutely. Excellent. So let's have a look at this, this result. So, you know, some of you, yes, have used an assessment tool. Um, great and delighted that you've done that. Um, I'm going to give you access to a free trial of a tool that we've got as a business, um, you know, a little bit later in the session. 21% uh, of you have read up on it. Eight, eight, eight of you actually voted there. Um, or 21% of you saying, no, you have not. Um, now, the reality is that often we'll actually look at it from the point of view that culture isn't something that we actually take into account in any great way. And that, for me, is part of the big challenge. Because when we actually design that piece of learning for uh, you know, presentation skills or negotiation skills or it's about our new LMS product or it's about a new piece of software that we've got, we'll design it with one general culture in mind. And I'm going to suggest that that culture is going to be our, our home culture. So if I'm based here in the UK, I'm going to probably design it with the UK audience in mind, for the most part. My activities, my, my discussions, my dialogues, everything that we're going to do in the session is going to be tailored towards that. And, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. But where it does start going wrong is when we take it outside of our actual own culture and we start bringing that program more to a global audience. Because what we've got is we go from the sense of having global learners who we can actually probably uh, put into a kind of pigeonhole, put them into a box and say, well, they're all learners. They're all going to be the same. But the reality is that those global learners actually now have a local overlay that we need to be very much more aware of and very mindful of. And culture itself is one of those things that is very obvious when you travel to and from countries. You see culture if you're at the, the actual airports. You see it. You're probably seeing it in your own personal lives right now. You know, you'll have friends that might actually come from different cultures. And sometimes that's obvious. But when we actually think about our learner audience, is it as obvious as it should be? And that's really one of the first things I'd, wa I'd want to challenge you to, is get you thinking about when you design or you're delivering training to an audience that is multicultural, what adjustments do you make, if any? Because part of this crusade for me started when I was handed off a training program that had been designed for a U.S. audience, you know, English-speaking, native English-speaking, so no real issues there. And I was asked to deliver it to an audience that were based in Shanghai, Beijing, and, and Australia. It was, it was on virtual. It was in a, a, we were using a, a different platform at the time. But I didn't get any difference in terms of the, the duration of program. So the three-hour training program we, that was designed and delivered in the US was suddenly being delivered to this Asian audience in exactly the same amount of time. There was no adjustment. And the challenge for that is that this local overlay that I talked to really actually is, is a real challenge. Because you know, if you think about culturally how we are, and I'm going to dive a little deeper into culture and then give you um, the opportunity to download an actual worksheet that will help you to look at this. We're all very different, but we're all very similar in three key ways. So I'm not talking about color of skin here. I'm not talking about language. I'm talking about behavior. I'm talking about how we actually uh, interplay with one another, how we actually act. So we can be different, but also similar in the way that we interact with one another. I'm sure you've probably got great examples where you know, you'll meet with uh, work colleagues, you know, new friends, and some of them may actually want to shake hands with you. Some of them might be comfortable to give you a hug. You know, some might actually just stand back, and you've got to respect personal space. 
those elements, as we actually think about different cultures, are because of the way that they actually are. There may be differences in the way that they actually manage the work and the attitude to the, the actual task that you, you're setting them to actually take. And there's definitely differences in the way that people think about problems and the way that they actually present solutions. And let me just very briefly get you thinking about the differences as you actually train different cultures and how they respond to questions that you ask. You know, so for instance, if we actually, um, I, w I worked quite extensively with an audience in India, um, you know, a couple of years back. And when I asked a question, not only did I actually get the response from them, but I actually got a lot of their thinking behind that. They wouldn't just explain what their answer was. They had to demonstrate that they had gone through a thinking process, that they had actually deliberated and gave me some of that rationale. Now, if you think about it, coming back to you know, the hard and fast element of the, the actual uh, the classroom, we need to design space. You know, I'm just saying Nina's comment there, but we need to design space to allow some of that explanation or some of that thinking to take place. You know, uh, Nina's talking there a bit more of the visual element. You know, when, when designing virtual spaces for, virt uh, for multicultural learners, it's more critical to choose images that aren't US or English centric. It, it, and you're right, Nina, and, and thanks for calling that out. It's a huge challenge. You know, if you have a slide deck um, and, and you're presenting and you're using more images and you're, you're showing images and every person on that, on that slide deck is white, or every person on that slide deck is male. Um, you know, and it might not be everyone, but if you're not being inclusive, you're not applying to the diversity challenge there of, of making sure that your, your imagery doesn't jar or doesn't actually bash into the culture that you're actually training to, that is a huge challenge. And, and we do training programs which actually center around in that in that a lot more different way. But we are different in these different ways. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to actually think about it for a second and think, well, how different are we? Which of these challenges have you maybe experienced with learners that you've had from different cultures? So it might be differences in the way they want to interact with you, differences in the way of thinking, differences in timekeeping, presenting information, or taking risks. While we go to that, um, Joel, is there any question that you've seen that you want to pick up on? Um, not at this, and not at this time, David. I'll keep you up uh, informed, though. Okay. I've got oh, one uh, here from Nina. One in there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yep. No, one from Nina is ready for you. Okay. Can you share how you help businesses define and see their own organizational cultures? Sometimes with multicultural organizations like United Nations, they're literally made up of hundreds of individual cultures. Yet, so there's a very specific organizational culture about the way we are and the way we do things. Any strategies that have worked well for you? Nina, thank you for the question. Um, you know, a large part of it really comes to the fact of making people aware that culturally those differences exist. And as a result, what we've got to do is actually not stay with one way of doing things or one way of thinking. You know, it's not that our way is right and your way is wrong, um, but we have to be more inclusive of, of these different cultures and, and more aware. Uh, and this is where, a, a, as, as a company, Virtual Guru's TMA World, which is our sister company, we talk about helping organizations to be cult com culturally intelligent. You know, is that awareness, that understanding that, okay, yeah, we've got an awareness that we interact differently, we manage differently, we think differently, but what does that mean from an organizational development perspective? And I'm going to take us a little bit deeper in terms of, of, of some of that understanding now. So when we actually think about these three differences, or these three key areas, we can think about it in terms of a continuum. And you know, what we're actually doing here is looking at three areas. But as I said earlier, we look at this big ball of water that we actually all live on, the, you know, the world. We've got this, the same world that we're all looking at. So it might be the same task. It might be the same activities. It might be the same teams but we're actually all looking at it differently because we're looking at it through our own cultural lens. You know, I, you know, I'll give you a great example in terms of myself. Born in the UK, so born in Scotland. Um, in 1995, I left Scotland and started traveling throughout Europe. 
and ended up um, staying in Spain for about three years. I left Spain and came back to the UK and actually married a, a lady in England and have lived in England now for the best part of 19 years. For the last 10 years, I've been working internationally, predominantly with an American audience. So you can imagine that my cultural lens, you know, the glasses that I wear culturally, is giving me a slightly different perception than maybe the David Smith from Scotland that, that was there back in 1995. Because I've now got a lot of different influences. My, my history has been changed over the years in terms of where I've actually worked or where I've lived or, or who's influenced me. And as a result, my view of the world has actually been molded, has actually been changed to accommodate that. But when we actually look at culture, and in particular organizational development culture, we can actually look at it from the point of view of how we relate to one another, which is very much that piece about how we actually interact with one another. Um, and as I say, I'm going to go slightly deeper into each of these three areas in a second. There's regulating, which is how we actually manage our work together. Um, and again, that, that's about managing um, power, it's managing time, it's managing authority. And reasoning, which very much, and I, I, I'm fascinated by this section about how we all, as, as we work in this world together, we may all work in business English, but we all think differently about problems and we all present differently in terms of our actual solutions. And this is actually um, TMA's World Prism, um, which actually forms part of Country Navigator, and, you know, if you've been on webinars with me in the past uh, and meeting one, you'll know that we're a huge fan of giving you lots of value, lots of resources. So stay with us to the end. There's a lot of different elements you're going to be able to download. There's um, uh, an extract from an e-book around cultural intelligence that a colleague of mine has written, Terence Brake, which will explain these three dimensions in a lot more detail than I'm going to within the next sort of five, ten minutes that I'll explore them with you. Um, but as well as that, there's a lot of different content that you're going to be able to pick up on. So let, let's start looking at this, and then we'll start flipping this around and thinking, well, how does that give us the challenge in the actual virtual classroom or the classroom, and what can we do about it? So the first element in terms of relating is there are differences in the way that we actually want to interact or communicate with one another. And you know, if we think about it in terms of a continuum, and it goes from one extreme to the other, then we can actually think about um, you know, one far end of that continuum culture-wise is that we're much more task-focused. Now, I'm pretty certain that those of you from America are probably going to go, yeah, that, that's me. That's us. You know, time is money for us. Um, it's all about getting the job done. Pleasantries are great, but we don't need to deal with those. We just want to get straight to the job or straight to the task. If, like me, you're much more relationship-focused, you're going to actually put a lot more thought in terms of, you know, hey, Joel, how are you? How was your weekend? You know, you, the way in which you communicate with people is, is much more, I guess to some, to some extent, it would be seen as maybe a little bit more personal. You're actually focusing a little bit more on the relationship maybe than someone that's much more task-focused. We can then actually think about the way in which those two different cultures or two different continuums actually use um, the use of language. Now, explicit isn't that they're cursing and swearing, but it's explicit from the point of view it's direct language. Language is, is obvious. The meaning is very much on the surface. You know, it's very much what we say is what we mean. But if, so again, you know, um, Germany might be a, a little bit in that sort of realm. Some of the European countries may be, but definitely as we actually think and we move towards Asia and the Middle East, it's going to be much more implicit in terms of the language they're going to use. The meaning is below the surface, you know, and you've really got to dig deep and you've got to really think about what's being said as well as what's not being said. You know, I mean, in the UK, for instance, we've got an expression which is, yeah, that's interesting. Now, to the native English speaker, you may think, well, that's interesting. This person's interested in what I'm saying. And it's actually not. It's a bit of a bluff. It's, yeah, that's interesting. I'm not convinced yet. Um, give me a bit more information. But that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is that's interesting. So the way in which we use language can be quite a challenge for us. I can see that, um, you know, I'm going to guess, Alison, that you're based here in the UK, because I see a smiley face from you there in terms of the chat. Um, 
but definitely, you know, I mean, we can we can all sort of sit there and think, yeah, nodding heads. We've seen these things happening. We recognize them. The third element in terms of communication is the the individual's approach. Are we individual in nature? You know, so I'm I'm happy to volunteer. I'm happy to be the first. I'm happy to speak out. Or do I need the sanctity of the group? You know, am I going to be much more, I want us to discuss things and, and collaborate a little bit more before we come to a conclusion. And, you know, as you look through these three elements within communication, just start thinking about how that actually manifests itself in learning. Because if you consider that, I'm, let's say I'm task focused, I'm going to be quite happy with you giving me very simple, straightforward instructions and setting me off to go and do a task. But if my colleagues are much more relationship focused, and let's think about in the virtual classroom we put people into a breakout room, you know, let's say we've got US audience in there as, as well as say for instance people that are coming from say for instance China or Latin America, the Americans will get straight to task and they'll be comfortable doing that. But the Latin Americans will be wanting to actually find out about the group that they're working with. They'll want to understand who people are. And as a result, there's, there's immediately where culture is going to give us a challenge. Because, you know, I want to get to the task. Let's just get on with the job. Yeah, but who are you? How do I understand you? You know, how can I relate to you? How, how can I trust you? There's a bit of relationship building needs to take place. So I see lots of different comments coming in there, but I agree. Um, you know, Nina talking, it's a fascinating range to categorize these areas. I feel similar to... I hope they'll pronounce this correct, Oan. I used to live and work in West Africa and really got a wake-up call to my alignment to the left as much as I like to think I'm aligned with the right. And, and Juan, thank you very much for, for confirming how you actually pronounce your name. And apologies for mispronouncing in the first place. Um, having the name David, people don't tend to get that wrong very often. But you know, you're, you're right there, Nina, in terms of we have a perception of we are where we are culturally. And it's only when we actually look at evaluating where we are that we get a much better steer. And you'll get an opportunity to do that with the, the trial version that we're going to give at the end. The second dimension for culture is about how we manage. So this is very much about how we actually manage um, decisions. I know it says risk taking and risk avoiding, but this is very much more about how we actually t take risk when we make decisions. Do we do that from a, an uninformed perspective? I'm a risk taker. I'm quite happy to go with my gut feel. I can just, I can go with it. I'm happy to do that. Or again, do I need the group mentality here? Am I going to want a lot more information before I make that risk or make that decision? And again, think about when you actually ask someone a question in a, in a classroom or in a session. Someone that's more of a risk taker, they might be much more inclined to actually jump straight in and give you a response. Whether they think it's right or wrong or indifferent, they might just be... Um, quite eager, quite enthusiastic to do that with you. A culture that's much more risk avoiding, they're going to want to make absolutely sure that they're correct before they respond to you. And we'll dive a little deeper into that a little later. Fascinating one for here, and, and this is one that everyone seems to recognize when we actually think about culture, is the differences that our cultural colleagues around the globe think about time. You know, it's, I think it's fair to say that in general, um, Germany and Austria are our timekeepers of the world. You know, when, when we say it's 10 o'clock, it's definitely 10 o'clock. Whereas, I guess, Latin America, Middle East, tends to be a little bit more loose on time. So it's much more, um, you know, yeah, we said we'd meet about 10, but let's get down to business at 10.30. Uh, and one of the ways that I, I remember getting this described very early on was that it's not that people that are loose with time are tardy with their time. It's not that they're bad timekeepers. It's just that they actually have a different perspective in terms of how they view time itself. So those that actually are, are very much more tight in terms of their use of time, they're almost, they're governed a lot more by the time, by the calendar, by the clock. But those that are loose with their time are very much more building, um, they're, they're relationship focused. They're very much more it's not so much paying attention to the time, it's more about paying attention to the activity. So for instance, if you're in the Middle East, 
and you're actually in a discussion, and you're, let's say your, your meeting was actually meant to run from 10 to 12, and that discussion is going so well, nobody's going to end that meeting at 12 o'clock. They're going to want to continue with it. Why? Because it's more important that they continue with the activity rather than be governed or ruled by the actual clock itself. So it's really interesting when you dive into that. The third element in terms of management is how we actually manage power and authority. You know, so it's, again, different continuums. Um, we're, either, we're happy to have a shared power and authority, so we can, we can share those roles around, all much more concentrated. And if you think about the countries of the world, where you know, it's much more of an elected official compared to, say, for instance, dictators or, or royalty, for instance. You know, again, that gives you a start to give you a sense of, of where those cultural differences actually are. The third element is all about reasoning. It's, it's how we think. It's how we actually present. And again, I'm sure you're going to actually be nodding heads there thinking, yeah, I've seen this. There are certain individuals, you know, again, if we think about role culture, you might think of someone like an engineer um, who's much more going to be fit linear in terms of their thinking, step by step. You know, it, it's a process. It, it's something that we're going to actually move quite quickly, but there's a methodical way that we actually do that. Or I guess, and I'm going to give a shout out to Brittany, who's on the team here, in terms of our creatives, they can maybe be a little bit more circular in their thinking. They can be much more in terms of um, theory and hypotheticals and ideas, and, and there could be a sense of randomness to it. But it's just how they actually are. Um, there's very much, again, the fact of, do we actually work with facts, or are we actually happy to work with theory? And then the final dimension there is the way in which we explain back. You know, are we simple in terms of our explanations, or do we tend to go quite complex? And I already gave you the, the brief example, but um, someone that might be simple, might, you know, and it's simple in terms of the way they explain things, um, it also tends to tie up to explicit language, you know, in terms of the first dimension, in, in terms of the communicating piece. So someone, uh, say for instance, Germany, uh, the US, might be much more simple but explicit in the language that they actually use. It's quite direct. Part of that might actually be tied to the fact that they're task focused. But someone that's quite complex would definitely be, say, for instance, our colleagues in India, where they actually want and need to reveal what that thought process has been, what they've actually gone through. So these three dimensions, if you, if you like, in terms of the world prism, what we can then actually do is map them out. And this is where we actually really start getting to a level of understanding, which helps us to change our perspectives on why those differences are there, what is actually happening. So here, what you're actually seeing is those same three dimensions in terms of rela relating, regulating, and reasoning. The blue dots is one culture. The orange dots is a completely different person. And what you're now starting to see is where some of the gaps might ex actually exist. And it's when those gaps actually exist that there becomes confusion, there becomes misunderstanding there becomes frustration and challenge between one culture and the other actually working or integ integrating with one another. And you see that Brittany's just put a comment in the chat. We are going to give you an opportunity to download a version of this right at the very end. Um, you'll be, you will actually be able to then actually use that with your learner audience, use it to kind of evaluate where you think different cultures actually exist. You know. Um, uh, and I, I really encourage you to do that, because once you start developing this intelligence, this insight, I guarantee your approach to how you actually look at a multicultural audience will change completely. So, Joel, I'm going to stop a second. Let's just have a quick look, see what questions we want to cover, and maybe grab one or two, and then we'll look on how this actually now changes how we need to think about our learners. Because we've spoken so far about the cultural piece, now let's look at how that throws up challenges. What Absolutely. questions have you got that you want to pick up on? Um, I'd like to point on the, in the chat, Juan made a great point regarding the frustrations sometimes presenters have with their uh, learners. And uh, I was wondering if you could maybe talk on that a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I can remember probably my very first multicultural audience um, was Asia. 
you know, I had an audience in, in Australia, but also in, in Asia. And I can remember at the time, I, I, and it was partly the, the un, unknown. It was partly I, I didn't know any differently. But what I would do is I was actually focusing more on the Australian learners and getting their responses because there was no challenge to me listening to them. I could hear exactly what they were saying. I didn't have to actually strain my hearing to actually try and understand what they were saying. Whereas some of those audiences, you know, at the time, China, Beijing, uh, you know, Shanghai, I found it quite difficult to start with. Uh, and, you know, I personally was guilty of just doing exactly that, focusing on the audience that I found that was easy for me to work with and not disregarding, but not focusing as much on the other audience. And, and one of the things that I found that's worked extremely well over the years has been for me to not rely on one method of, of actually communicating with that audience. So, you know, uh, when you talk about the actual frustration, and, and one of the things that I often hear about is um, a facilitator asking someone um, to respond, and they respond, and, and they, they, the actual response isn't clear. So it's then, sorry, can you repeat that? Can you repeat that? Can you repeat that? And it becomes a little frustration trying to creep in. The one bit of guidance I would give you in terms of virtual classroom, which I think is absolutely wonderful, is don't be handcuffed to the idea that you've always got to have a verbal response from the audience. We've got chat mechanisms. Um, you know, we've got ability to actually ask people, sorry, didn't quite hear what you said there. Can I ask you to type it in chat? One of the things that you will find is that multicultural learners often can read and write English better than they can listen and talk English. Now, I'm not trying to be disrespectful there, but it often is easier for them to actually type it and read it on screen than it is for them to articulate or for them to process it in a different way. And we've got an example for that in, in a second as well. It's a great question. Um, I see there's quite a few others. Uh, Ramona, do you determine where people fall in the chart by their self-statements or through your observation? Um, Ramona, great question, and, and I think what actually happens is so very often we don't pay any attention to it until it's too late. We don't pay any attention to, until they're actually in our session, and by then we can only do it through observation. Really what I'm, I'm, I'm advocating here is for us to think beyond being reactive to the audience and much more being proactive to them. So thanks for your question. I'm going to tackle um, six challenges that we actually have when we actually think about our multicultural audience. The first and probably the most obvious one for most of us is where that audience is English second or third language. You know, we, we have this worldwide belief that, you know, global English is the business language. And I'm pretty certain if I was to actually do a poll with you right now and say how many of you have actually rolled out global programs where you know that the program's being delivered in, in English, the content's been designed in English, the handouts are all in English, yet you have an audience that comes to the session and their, their command of English is quite poor. I'm pretty certain if I asked you to raise your hand, most of you are probably going to come back and say, yes, we've had experience of that. The second one, and this is starting to, to actually delve into how those cultures actually work, differences in the way that you actually have interaction with your learner audience. It might be that you're going to see differences in the technological comfort of that learner audience. Not everyone's going to be comfortable learning in a virtual classroom because it might not be commonplace for them. It might not be uh, a common experience that they have. There's definitely, in terms of culture, differences in how we actually, as an audience, how they would actually view you as the facilitator. Differing expectations around um, sessions delivery and the, and the method or the style they actually expect from us. And differences in the technology standards as we go around the world. What we're going to do is we're going to spend a bit of time looking at each of these six challenges. Um, and, you know, as I say, keep those questions coming in. Um, we'll tackle as many of them as we can go along with. But let's look at the fact that most often what we're going to be dealing with was, is an audience where English is second or third language for them. You know, for me, English is my second language. I'm Scottish first and foremost. I'm, I'm only kidding. Um, but, you know, I take my hat off to anyone that's learning any subject that's not in their native tongue. Because how challenging must that actually be? 
you know, if you think about it, there's going to be challenges in terms of the way in which they actually respond to us. You know, and again, I've started talking about that already, about, you know, the use of written English and spoken English is so vastly different. One of the key things that I started seeing in our design work at Virtual Gurus was when we are designing for multicultural audiences, we tend to put a little bit more direction on slides or in participant guides or in handouts. You know, than maybe we'd actually do if we were actually training a, a, a native English audience. You know, so we may actually have things like uh, much more um, the question going up on the slide at the time that you're asking it, or maybe asking the virtual producer to put that question into chat at that point in time. So again, there's that visual reference for the audience. If we think about um, as we, we take information in auditorily, you know, through listening to it, there's only about 5% of the world actually enjoys doing that. The rest of us, the 95% of us, we don't enjoy taking it in order, orderly. We prefer visual. We prefer textual. And that really can be a bit of a challenge. But one of the things I want to ask you to focus on and think about is the cognitive load that we actually put those English second or third language learners under. There's additional thinking time or processing time that's actually needed. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask uh, Joel to very kindly step up and, and help to, to demonstrate this with us. Because I'm going to actually show Joel a passage of, of text which is written in English. Joel, you, you're a native English speaker, aren't you? I am. I am. You are, based over there in Denver. So this shouldn't sure. be a challenge for you. But what it's going to do is demonstrate to you some of the cognitive load that we actually put our learners under. So Joel, are you ready? I'm ready. Oh. All I want to do is ask you just to read what's written on screen be on, be, uh, underneath this title of Assaulting the Senses. Are you ready? Go. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, one of the most challenging aspects of working in English is reading. Uh, in my native language, we use symbols to illustrate meaning. Uh, okay, Joel, let me stop you there. <laughs> if I was to ask you a question now and, say, and ask, what is one of the most challenging aspects of working in English? What do you think it would be? Um, uh, oh, uh, reading. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. you actually read it. You, that's what you read. But let me back up a second and just ask you, how challenging did that actually feel? And I know that you and I had, had talked about doing this, but you hadn't seen the text before. But how challenging was this for you? Extremely challenging. I uh, it was having a really hard time also just reading from right to left as opposed to the opposite, right to left, as I traditionally, I usually do, or excuse me, left to right. So that's what that yeah. really threw me off. Yeah, and, and you know, dare I actually say, we have cultures around the world that actually do write and read right, right to left, not the left to right that we do in the Western world. You know, there are cultures that actually read, uh, and you know, Dominic, thank you very much, Arabic. You know, there are cultures that actually are much more ideographic in terms of their language. You know, they use symbols more than anything else. And as a result, you know, and, and yes, you had frustration there. You had probably a sense of embarrassment, maybe, because you were faltering over the actual text. Yep. Yet, you know, it's in English. And okay, I know it's a, it's a bit of a, you know, we, we've pulled the wool over your eyes to some extent in terms of it's not quite in English because it's written backwards. But it demonstrates quite exquisitely the fact that we actually throw our multicultural learners under the bus with this language challenge. We ask them to do things in the same length of time that it takes a native speaker. It doesn't work. You know, I'm sorry, if you're, um, if you're Chinese or you, you're, you're Singaporean or you're Indian and, and English is not your native tongue and you get asked a question in English, the first thing you actually need to do in your mind is to translate that possibly back into your own language to make sure you actually understand the question correctly. And then you've got to think about your response in your native tongue and then translate it back into English to actually verbalize that back to the actual facilitator in the group. That takes time. And that's the real challenge that I picked up on when I was actually working with the audience to start with. One of the things that really picks up on that is the fact that often, Again, this seems to be something that really affects um, second and third language students. We get little or no interaction as a result. Now, I, I think I spotted a comment from Karen 
um, Karen Greenfield talking about um, people dropping out of breakout rooms. Um, um, so interesting is we're actually talking today about reasons why some colleagues tend to drop from the session before a breakout didn't think it could be about cultural differences. Let me share with you, and it could well be that, um, you know, the fact that, well, hang on, I'm now going to get put into an environment where I'm going to have to interact. I didn't expect this. Um, I'm, I'm going to maybe be exposed to my, my, my use of English is maybe not as strong or maybe not as good. I'm going to have that embarrassing factor of people asking, what was that you said? Can you repeat that? But it also could be, you know, one of the reasons for little or no interaction. You know, when we actually think about it, if a learner doesn't understand the question you've asked, then the chances are they're not going to respond. And this is something I, I found very, um, very extensively throughout Asia. Um, an Asian learner, if they don't understand the question you've asked, they are too polite to actually say, I didn't understand, in the main, they'll just go on silent. What about if they understand the question, but what if I'm wrong if I respond? We're talking to hear things like Huanji, which is that loss of face that actually exists within Asia. You know, a learner can be embarrassed by actually providing a response that's incorrect. Now, it may be that the peer group doesn't laugh at them, but they'll actually take it as it, it's, it's an embarrassment for them. So they won't respond. It's safer for them not to respond than respond. And it could well be that, you know, I don't know how to respond. You know, in the face-to-face -face classroom, we can often get response just by actually looking around the room. It's not too much of an issue. It's not so, too much of a problem. But when we're in the virtual classroom, of course, we lose that sight. And if we're not direct enough in saying, OK, I've asked a question, and I want you to respond by putting in chat, or I want you to respond by raising your hand to speak out, or David, I want you to respond to it. If we're not clear, that clarity is going to confuse. And it's definitely going to confuse more the English second or third language learner. Let's briefly take a look at the, 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 the sort of style of the session that we actually probably want to design and deliver. You know, we often think about these tools actually helping us to be able to collaborate much more effectively, bring learners together, get them discussing and doing group activities, breakout activities. And there definitely are going to be cultures that actually think, yes, let's, let's eat this up. I'll, I'll do this all day long. You know, definitely much more of the Western cultures. They're much more eager to get involved and collaborate and get, get into the discussion. You know, they're much more comfortable working as part of a group. You know, and, you know, they might be, some of the, that group might be individualistic in nature, so they might be quite comfortable at taking turns at leading the discussion and being spokesperson and all the rest of it. But equally, the opposite end of that is cultures that they, they don't want to do that. It's maybe they don't want to because they're not comfortable with it. You know, it might be that they're much more happy dealing with it on an individual level rather than it being on a group level. Um, you know, it could be that, that it's down to they don't want to volunteer. You know, they don't want to be the, 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 the spokesperson. They don't want to contribute in that same way. And part of that really comes to, and we'll talk to it in a second, about the way in which different learners around the world learn differently. You know, some of it may actually be, well, hang on, in a virtual classroom, I'm not yet comfortable with the technology. It could be that what we've actually got is we're introducing virtual classroom to our audience for the very first time, and yet they've had years, decades even, of learning in a face-to-face -face environment. It might be you're trying to push technology into your organization as a learning tool, and it's brand new to them. And what often happens is we push the learning and the content, and yet we've not actually helped our learners understand how they're going to learn within that environment. We've not orientated them to them. We've not got them ready for it. So they may not be comfortable learning within the virtual classroom itself. You know, if, you, if you've had years and years and years of getting training delivered to you in a face-to-face -face context, from kindergarten right up, you've gone to school, you've gone to college, you've gone to university, you've had corporate learning that's all been traditional face-to-face, -face, and now suddenly we're going to switch it to virtual or digital, is the learner ready for it? You know, I, I go and I speak at the, the, a lot of the different conferences. I hear lots of dialogue, lots of discussion about the latest and greatest next thing that's happening. You know, augmented reality. 
you know, artificial intelligence, you know, virtual reality. And I get asked, you know, when are, how are we going to actually integrate that into learning? And I often think we're not integrating technology well enough yet, never mind the latest technology. So it's about making sure that our learners are comfortable and learners are actually ready. And importantly, what about setting the right expectations for your learner audience about how they should behave? I don't mean in a childish way, but how they should interact in a virtual classroom. What's expected of them? You know, if any of you want to actually get a copy of the, the set of expectations that we use in every virtual classroom session, um, I'll ask one of the team just to drop my email into, into chat there. But send me an email. I'm, I'm more than happy to actually send you a copy of the expectations that we set with every audience. Because this is a new environment for them. You need to help them understand which way to actually work. How about how the audience views you as the facilitator? Now, you're probably thinking, what do, what do you mean? We're the facilitator. We're, we're just the person that turns up and delivers the training. But again, as we go around the world culturally, you actually have revered experts. So you, know, you may go to the, the Gurukula, which is the, um, the schooling within India, where the gurus are the, are the people that actually do the teaching. Or if you think about it as you travel around the world and think about martial art, you've got sensei and master. You know, in, in Asia, you've got the Confucian teacher-pupil mentality, where the expectation of that audience is that you as the, the facilitator, the trainer, are the all-seeing, all-knowing expert. They're actually they are expecting you to hold all the answers. They don't expect you to ask them, well, okay, let's collaborate. You know, let's get um, me facilitating the training, not teaching you. You know, getting that collaboration happening, that sits quite difficult for them. You know, because if their if they're learning, again, over the years has been we learn from the person at the front of the class rather than we learn with the person at the front of the class, that's a completely different expectation. And, and I think often what we actually do is we try and force the collaboration to happen because we think that's what should happen, and yet what we actually do is we actually go against what the learner wants to do. And Karen, you're absolutely right. It's, it's a phrase that's been used for a number of years now. No more sage on stage instead of having a guide on the site. And that's all very well, and we definitely don't want to be using these technologies just to lecture to our audience. Um, we want to be much more facilitative, much more discussive, much more collaborative. But sometimes it's not going to actually sit completely with your audience. And then when we're actually still talking about, um, and, and one, in terms of what does that mean, um, sage on stage is the expression that's often used about um, lecturers. You know, if you think about a college lecturer, a university lecturer, I would say they're, they're much more the sage on stage. Um, they're, they're there to actually provide their expertise. They actually um, provide the, the learning through them telling you what it's all about. Whereas a, a facilitator is very much this guide on the side. You know, part of that learning is actually self-discovered. Part of it is actually guiding the learner through the process. And it's two expressions that have tended to be used over the last couple of years to actually talk about the difference between the college or university style lecturer um, delivery format and moving it much more to a kind of facilitative um, discussion meeting. Then the final component, and then I'm going to give you some tips, um, which is, again, there's a couple of downloads um, in terms of that, is going to be what about the technology infrastructure that's available to the learner in their location, their business location? You know, they might have bandwidth issues. You know, they may not actually have um, telephone lines. You know, there's parts of the world, there are companies that I know that have actually started taking static telephone lines off the, off the desks in an effort to save cost, maybe because they, 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 the technology isn't so much there. But what will happen is that those learners will actually start using Wi-Fi and mobile more. And one of the, one of the, the, the key things that we always ask is in a virtual classroom, don't use Wi-Fi, don't use mobile phone to join a session. Because the Wi-Fi signal, the mobile phone signal, is prone to, to movement. You know, it's going to fluctuate. And in a virtual session, I'm sure you've seen it, if your actual Wi-Fi signal comes and goes, it's going to drop you out the session. But maybe that's only all they've got in terms of infrastructure. Maybe that's all they can use. So again, you've got to think about 
you know, how the session may actually challenge the actual learner in terms of the technology. And how are you going to support them when actually things go wrong? You know, Dominic's making a point there, but Adobe Connect sometimes blocked partially in China, uh, for example. One of the things that it's often uh, not seen or not, not been aware of is if you actually Google um, Skype, Skype in certain countries, predominantly those countries where it's the, the government and the local, um, or the, the, the country actually runs the telephone lines, they ban Skype. And in some countries around the world, it's actually illegal for you to use Skype or voice over IP because what you're actually doing is you're taking away the potential profits that the country makes for, from the telephone lines. Again, uh, United Arab Emirates, um, Qatar, uh, you know, the, the, the Middle Eastern world tends to be much more obvious than that. So I'm going to leave you with very briefly seven tips. Uh, and we've actually got, again, a handout for you, so don't worry too much about this. But really, it's a kind of summary of what we've been talking about as we've gone along in this session. You know, if you're designing and facilitating to a multicultural audience, you cannot do it with the same expectation that the same activities are going to take the same time. There's processing time, there's cognitive load, etc. You're going to have to think about adapting the activities. Now, that might not be a redesign of the activity, but it might be the facilitator actually being quite adaptive to the fact that in the moment, I might need to actually go a different way with this activity. I know the, the instructional designer said it's a breakout activity, but knowing my audience, it might be I, I keep it in plenary. I keep it in the main room. It's, it's not just about the instructional design. It's about the actual delivery design. Um, there's a, a need for us to actually make sure that our audience is comfortable in the virtual classroom, either ahead of the actual session or right at the very beginning of the session. So part of it is, it, you know, particularly with a multicultural audience, making sure that you use the easier tools first if it's brand new for virtual classroom. So getting people to use the chat, getting them to use the polling tool, for instance. As a facilitator, it's making sure that we don't stay handcuffed to only looking for verbal response. It's creating alternative response mechanisms. Turn around and say, OK, hey, bye. I'm sorry, I can't understand. And it's not saying this exactly, but it's, hey, bye. I'm, I'm sorry, that wasn't clear. Can I ask you to put that into chat for me? And, and sort of giving that person time to type into chat and then working with it. Understand what the participants will expect of you. You know, we, we can talk about in general senses, but don't be stuck in the one way of delivering your actual session. It's a bit adapting. You know, like every good presenter, you're going to adapt to the audience that you've actually got in front of you. One of the things that I love to pieces, um, and we've not really talked too much about it, it the, there's a great element in the ebook that we've put together for you is avoiding the use of slang and idioms. If you think about it, in, in the US, you would tend to use an awful lot of sporting analogies. You hit it out the park. He did a home run. Well, what if I don't understand baseball? You know, somebody thinking, I hit it out the park. What does that mean? And, and one, you're absolutely right, like Sage on the stage. You needed clarity on that one. You know, it's, it's a little like in, in the Western world, we use this expression for there's not enough space. So it's, you, know, you can't swing a cat in here. Well, can you imagine if somebody said that in a training room that was full of multicultural audience, and they're thinking, well, hang on, what, what does this guy have against cats? You know? So think about our use of, of language and the way we actually use that all the time. Um, and then test the technology before you roll it out. You know, it's, it's absolutely crucial. Um, I'm going to give you an opportunity in a second to actually um, access a link to um, Country Navigator, which actually gives you access to that tool that uh, dimension. But we're going to actually just get Patricia just to say a few words, and then we'll carry on the conversation as long as you want to. Thank you, David. I would like to interject momentarily for a short announcement. At this time, we will open up a brief live demo of Adobe Connect in another virtual room. We invite you to join us. If you have any questions or would like to learn more about hosting your own virtual sessions, meetings, or webinars using Adobe Connect. I will now turn the session back over to your presenter to continue answering any questions you may have for today's presentation. Back to you, David. Excellent. Thanks, Patricia. OK. So what we're going to actually do, uh, and I'm just going to say thank you very much for taking the hour out of your day. I know it was a little bit more than that because you joined us a little earlier. But taking the hour out to actually listen to 
the multicultural challenges that exist for us. Um, as I said right at the very beginning, I'm a huge fan of giving additional value left, right, and center. So you can see at the very bottom of your screen, there's four different sets of takeaways there. Cultural intelligence for better intercultural communication. It's a, an extract from a, a cultural intelligence book that a colleague of mine actually has written, um, you know, based around the actual work that we've done as TMA World and under the Country Navigator. The participant survey to determine learner cultural dimensions is actually the, 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 the three continuums. So you can take a look at that and you can actually ask your audience if you wanted to, to actually fill that in before coming to a session. Cultures Unite webinar slide deck. It's a PDF version of the deck that I've been using today. You're more than welcome to that. And then the seven expert tips for building cultures conscious competence is those seven tips, but actually in an ebook format in a much more detail. Um, and the link in the middle, try the country navigator. So Joel, I'm pretty conscious that we're bang on time or thereabouts. What questions do you want to pick up on that we've not picked up so far? I haven't seen any come in late, but anyone who has questions, feel free to direct them to the Q&A pod. Uh, David and the team here at Meeting One will stay on for a little longer, so please feel free to ask any questions you have. We've had some great conversations, so we'd like to continue that. Excellent. And seeing a lot of those comments in terms of, you know, Tanya, thank you very much. Um, Karen, delighted to have you on the session. Others, I know that you're actually looking to jump to another call, another meeting, another event, and that seems to be the world that we're working in. Um, uh, Jennifer, iPad will not allow you to download the documents um, on the mobile. Um, you've got them on computer, but I'm sure we can probably actually send them to you in the actual um, follow-up email. Um, and Joel, can I just confirm, are, are those takeaways accessible through the thank you email? Lacey's asking that question there. We will make some of them available. Um, the slides should be available with that as well. And uh, yes, as Bernie indicated, they will all be included in the email. Excellent. I'm seeing the comment there from Jennifer. I was just in Mexico and talking with someone I work with. We used when pigs fly as an expression, and we had to stop and ask what it meant. Um, you know, yeah, the, the, the language we use in our everyday common vocabulary, which it resonates for us. We know it. We understand it. Our colleagues around us understand it. Um, but yeah, definitely those expressions there. Dominic, you know, my hat goes off to you. I appreciate it's uh, gone past midnight over there in Hanshu. I, I really appreciate you joining us, as I do everyone else. But knowing that you're going to wake up in four hours, go get some rest. rest absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, if there aren't any questions, I'm going to be quite happy to jump off the call. Um, if you do have any questions for me, I'm just going to put it back in there. Happy for you to either connect with me on LinkedIn, um, to actually reach out to me by email, um, or to actually follow me on Twitter. Um, you know, very happy to help in any way with um, discussion around either virtual classroom or culture. You know, you've got my email address up on screen. You've got our website there. As an organization, Virtual Gurus, we're very much about helping organizations make best use of web conferencing technology. But if there aren't any questions for me, um, I'm going to say thank you very much uh, for joining us in this session. Um, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday or Thursday, <laughs> depending where you are in the world. And I look forward to seeing you in another webinar pretty soon. Um, one, in terms of my Twitter handle, it's at DS virtually. Um, I'll just put that back in. It's there in the chat for you. Um, as I say, happy to continue the conversation. But for now, I'm going to say thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day, and I'll see you in another webinar soon.